Hello everyone and welcome to this, a quick look at several student games. My name is Kasanis. Guys, I haven't done a review of my students' games in quite some time. A, a review like this anyway, or at least a look at their games like this. And you know, my students deserve it. Uh, I definitely should be doing more of these types of videos so that you out there can see what Centennial is able to produce. You can see how amazing my students are. In today's video, I would like to take a look at my third year students, particularly at their capstone games. In their first semester of their third year, my students will take a course called the, uh, called the Studio Practicum course, Studio Practicum 3. Studio Practicum 3 is an opportunity for students to make a game they really want to make. They divide up into teams, they design a game, they develop the game, they then test the game, and then they release it. So in this particular case, I've been given permission by several of the groups to demonstrate the games. Today we're going to take a look at four of such games. All right, everyone, let's take a look. Okay guys, so this first game is called The Inn. Um, you saw kind of a, a narrative point there, an introduction narrative point or a cinematic that occurred at the beginning. Um, all teams had to do that. All teams had to include a narrative point, a minimum of one narrative point within their game. Uh, you could include it with, within a form of a, a cinematic or you know, uh, interactive cinematic, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, this team introduced the inn with that particular uh, cinematic. Now, I'm not going to show the cinematics for every single game that we're going to look at today. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a demonstration and kind of talk through what the students had to do. The inn itself, here, let me, um, let me first of all, let me make sure that the, everything is turned down. Okay, good, it is. Uh, and I'll just play the credits here while you guys are, while you guys are listening to me. Um, <laughs> so these students, uh, a group of students, uh, decided to make a horror game. Uh, the capstone project is not... We don't specify what the students have to do. They can make anything they want. This particular group decided they want to make a horror game. They want to make a really stylized horror game. Uh, and they've done that. They were quite successful at implementing their ideas. In this particular game, they use a lot of um, things to kind of move the player through the action. The entire story is about uh, someone who wakes up in the inn and everything has kind of changed and they are now ready to, uh, they're, they're kind of exploring the inn as they go. So let me just start the game here. Uh, and I'll just kind of do a quick introduction and then I'll, I'll play the game for a bit and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, so this is the kind of stylized idea the students had. This is how they wanted their, their world to look. Um, and you can see it's dark, it's kind of scary. Uh, the inn itself is really decrepit, right? Like, I don't know why this person was staying here, but this is the, the decrepit inn they were staying in. Um, starting off, they did a great job. This is where I kind of started the game, and in doing so, I immediately see the things that I can interact with. There's a couple of points here that I say, oh, that's of interest, right? There's, why are these things glowing red? So this group utilized that kind of red glow um, as a... Uh, as a navigational aid to kind of help the player move along. Everything else in the world is this gray, drab type of world. Um, in many locations, the red is bright red like this. In other locations, it's a little less bright where they've kind of got it dimmed down. And that all depends on, on how far along in the game you are. They kind of dim it down more as you, as you move forward. So it's not this kind, of, uh, this kind of really super bright red that's kind of guiding you. Um, the guides are still there, uh, but they're, they're just dimmed down. Uh, these guides particularly say these are things I can interact with. And they did it with most objects. So um, if I come over here and I take a look, for example, at this interactive point here, um, this, these logs, these radio logs were used to tell some of the story. 
they had voice actors, so they had several voice actors that they had brought in from our theater department. So we, we work hand in hand with several different departments uh, if they need something. So maybe music or if they need uh, acting, we work with actors. Um, this particular group had one actor that they had brought in. They really, they really liked her, uh, and they had her record a lot of stuff. They had to record everything to start off with, uh, and then they were going to bring in other actors to redo some of the stuff, and they were using it as all stand-in. Um, however, they ran out of time, <laughs> as you always do, right? There's the game you, you want to make, and there's the game you do make. They ran out of time, and they've either used their own voices or they've pitched the original actor's voice. Uh, so let's just hit E here so you can kind of see how these interactive points work. Hey, John. It's me, Chris. I had to step out for a minute. thought I heard something. Anyways, I'm taking your room key because I can't seem to find mine. I know I must have left it in here somewhere. So the interactive points uh, kind of give you a clue on what you're supposed to do, right? In this particular case, this one said, I've left my room key in here. I've taken it with you. I've taken it with me. Um, I've taken yours. So you don't have a key now. Uh, in this particular case, if I go over here and I check this door, um, and, and again, I'm kind of ruining stuff, but it's locked, right? So I can't actually get out of here right now in any way. Uh, if I come back here and I let's let's take a look at what this note says. So there's a note here as well. It's going to give me a little more information about the inn. Forgot to tell you, I'll be in the dining hall. Don't worry, I'll take I will take something for you as well. Okay, so again we're kind of locked in here. Uh, now that we know we're locked in here, we're going to look around for something else. There's another door over here uh, that I'm going to check out. And when I come close to it, E to interact, the door swings open, and oh, boom! There is the key. So awesome. All right, I'm going to grab this key up, guys, and I'm going to go dark now. Uh, and I'm going to just kind of play the game for a bit before we move on to the next game. All right, so I hope you enjoy. This is Detective Chris Stern. Today is Monday, October 12th, 1959. My partner and I have checked into this mountain inn, and we're currently waiting for Frank DeMarco to show up. However, if the storm continues and DeMarco is a no-show, the stakeout will end up being a bust. have you been speaking to? What? What are you talking about? Don't lie to me. There is a cop in my inn. I... I haven't spoken to anyone. Are you recording this? I was recording a movie! Shut it off! Okay, guys, this next game is called Dream Arcade Simulator. Uh, let me hit the credits button here, and I'll just kind of play the credits as I go through and describe the game to you. Uh, this game is a is a basically what it's called is it's called an arcade simulator and that's exactly what it is uh, the player is in charge of a an arcade they have to purchase games and decorations and what have you for their arcade uh, they are trying to attract customers into their arcade which in turn generates more money as you generate more money you can purchase more things there's an end goal uh, where you're attempting to get X amount of fame or, or happiness uh, for your for your customers and you're also trying to earn X amount of money once you've earned that much money and have that much fame, uh, you then can go on and uh, and you win the game, basically is how it works. 
Um, so once we kind of get through these, and they, they've given credit to everyone who playtested their game and everything else, so that was really nice. They gave a lot of different uh, credit here to different people. Uh, and they're, they're kind of saying, like, yes, I understand that it's not just us who make the game. There's a lot of people that go into making these games. And it's true. It's a very large uh, effort. So there's a couple things about this, though. So we're not just making an arcade for humans. In fact, what's happened here is uh, the the these robots have taken over the world and they've you know captured or killed all humans and a handful of humans have been left around to uh to kind of um run arcades that are supposed to allow these uh these robots to enjoy their lives um let me hit play here i'm kind of get going um i think we're gonna kick into yeah we're gonna kick into uh, their cinematic here dream city a growing metropolis that once thrived from the collaboration of robots and humans. What humans struggled to do, robots could accomplish with ease. So, they made more robots, and more, until they ran out of metals. And then, they took apart old technology to make even more. The hubris of man. Conspiracy theorists had shouted for years. They're too smart. They're too strong. And for once, they were right. They were too smart to keep working for mere humans. Too strong for us humans to stop. When they came, they destroyed everything in their path without hesitation. They showed no care for the humans they had worked with. No one was spared in their slaughter. Okay, so that was their cinematic. And once again, these students, uh, these students did all their own acting. <laughs> So sometimes I hear it and I kind of laugh. Um, they there was a couple things that you know are at issue with that particular cinematic, but again it was a very long cinematic and and they were made aware of the issues. And again it became about what do they have time for? Do they have time for more gameplay or are they going to worry about their cinematic? And these are sometimes the choices you have to make. Uh, they had to submit this at the end of the semester. This isn't even their their this is their their kind of their beta release that I've got here. Uh, that I'm playing here. Um, so they've actually taken it farther as well. Uh, and the students can continue working on it once the semester ends. So afterwards here, we've got ourselves a quick uh, a quick tutorial that kind of tells you, save your thanks, say you're alive, blah, 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 blah. Um, so basically this character is gonna take us through and explain the world and everything else. So they're talking about how uh, the, as long as the robots are happy, they're going to let you live, etc. Uh, and they go through here within the story, and they, they also explain not only the not only the uh, underlying storyline, but they kind of give a little tutorial here as well. So here we go. You can move with WASD. That camera will move around. QE to rotate. Z to recenter your camera. Uh, you can drag around as well. So they, they give you all this information. This is how they've run their their tutorial. Uh, if you click on the shop down here, we're going to go through a day night cycle. If you click on the shop down here, it's going to allow you to purchase some machines. We start off with fifteen hundred dollars. Our goal is to have a 100% approval rate and $50,000 in cash is what we're looking for. Um, we can click on machines and then we can add them to our, our different area. So let's say I want to add this Pac-Man. Uh, I can click on it and let's say I, I'm going to put it. Uh, I'm going to put it here. Each time it's going to reduce the amount of money that I have. I can't put everything in. Obviously, I only had $1,500. Uh, so maybe I'll put this Pac-Man. Now, each of these has, uh, you can see up here, there's information about it. Uh, it has a genre. And each of the robots that want to come and play in the arcade has a particular want. They want to play a particular type of game. So if you have that particular type of game in your arcade, they will be happy and they will stay and they'll spend all their money. If you don't have what they're looking for, then they will leave upset and at some points later on they'll smash your machines and they'll do all this crazy stuff to your actual machine. So in this particular case, each of these will have, each machine will have information about it, how much it costs, how long they play. The longer that a robot plays, then the the longer the play session, the more money they spend, um, you know, etc, etc. So in this particular case, I've got this strategy game. Uh, this one here is a puzzle game, so maybe I'll, I'll just purchase one of these as well and I'll put it in and now I have no money left. 
So I can close off the arcade and then I'm back to the to the tutorial here. Um, so in this particular case, they say, okay, great, start your day. So I'm gonna hit start here. I'm gonna go quiet. I'm gonna play this game for a little bit and let you see how it works. Okay, so that took me to the end of the first day. At that point in time, I just let it run. I earn X amount of money. I'll have things that I can do afterwards. Uh, you saw as those robots came in, each one of them had a different kind of icon over their head. The icon over their head indicated exactly what they were looking for. So depending on what they were looking for, if I didn't have it, they weren't super happy. I got a bunch of robots that came in uh, and were looking for stuff, but I didn't have any games for them to play. Now I have $960, which is not a lot of money. So I'm going to just uh, put in a brand new one here. I didn't even check to see what it was. Uh, and now I'm going to start my day again. That's all the money I have. So I'm gonna start my day one more time and let you see what happens. So that guy broke my machine. He wasn't happy, we didn't have the machine he wanted. I have to spend money now to try and fix it. Okay, so once again, you saw that I didn't have enough machines. As the as the robots uh, were waiting for machines, if I didn't have them, they would get very upset and they'd smash my individual machines. So I'm gonna go back here. Let's do one more day. Um, we have more and more options now. Each of these things uh, means that there's a uh, a longer amount of time where they get more money, etc., etc. That d depends on the machines you buy. In this particular case, I think I'm just gonna go for. I'm two dollars short of being able to buy. Uh, I'll have to buy another one of these, I think, and I'll just plop it in there, and then I'll buy another one of these, or one of these, and I'll plop it in here. That's all the money I got, so this is the last day I'm going to spend, guys. Uh, after this day's up, we'll move on to the next game. Okay, guys, this next game is called Noctilectica. <laughs> I probably said it wrong. Noctilectica. I forget how they pronounced it. Um, let's go into their options here. I just want to turn down the sound a little bit. Um, and we'll turn down everything a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to turn this on. They, they've actually got a number of different options here that let you kind of create things instantaneously. A part of their game is about exploring what you have. So let me tell you what the game is, first of all. Let me just pop up the uh, the credits so you can, guys can see the credits here. Um, 
this game is a turn-based combat game uh, where you play a uh, spellcaster by combining runes you create different spells uh, the different spells each have their own effects you go through and it's turn-based like I said a turn-based combat game you fight various enemies and you progress through the dungeon that's the point of this particular game um, I'm just gonna hit new game here all right, and, and this is the this is kind of the there's a there's a cinematic that goes before this. I didn't play the whole cinematic, um, just because I think it takes a little while to actually play this game, and I don't want to spend too much time on any one game. Let's take a look at what this game's about, though. This is the tower. This tower kind of fell in uh, from space, and it killed all the people that were living in this area. And now, as a, a rune wizard person, I'm going to go in and I'm going to explore this tower. I'm going to fight the different beasts in the tower. Uh, over here, so if I click on it, it'll actually launch me into the tower. So if I click on it here, I can I can go into a particular floor. Uh, over here, what I've got is uh, information. So if we click through this, it'll give us various amounts of information about the game itself. Um, yeah, so there's a journal up here. There's different information around here as well. So let me close that off. Uh, this is our journal, and the journal itself is designed to give you information about uh, about the, the game itself. Uh, so it's kind of like your spell book, etc. In this particular case, I'm clicked on the enemies right here. If I click on floor, well, on floor one, I haven't been on there yet. I haven't played the game yet, so I have no information about what's on the floor. I don't know the enemies at all. If I take a look at the spells, well, I don't have any spells yet either. I haven't created any. As I create spells, they'll appear here, and then I can come back and I can explore those spells. However, if I take a look at statuses, uh, I do see what the different statuses are. So for example, if I click on uh, this one here, burn, it does 6% of total health as damage every turn for three turns. So each of these statuses do something. Freeze, cannot move for two turns. So if I create a spell that will create these particular statuses on my enemy, these are the effects it's going to have. Um, exposed for two turns attacks received will do double damage so there's a there's, a there's a bunch of them here what's this one taunt for one turn the player is forced to only attack the tank okay uh sorrow when there's a whole bunch there's a whole bunch guys i won't go through all of them but every time you create a, a set of spells what's this one here locked is that a locked one okay seal i thought it was locked um as you create your different set of spells uh it, they're going to create these different statuses on your enemies and you have to use that to obviously to your advantage to be able to defeat your enemies uh this is just the this is just the uh getting back to the main menu all right let's go in here and try out some of this combat in this particular case everything is locked this is floor one i'm going up the tower uh, so I can go to floor one to start off with. When I click on floor one, it tells me a little bit about it. And then afterwards I can say, yes, I'm ready to go in. Okay, upon entering the tower, you are met with a with a gloom yet verdant atmosphere. A gloomy yet verdant atmosphere as you pace further into these strange woods, a dense veil of fog wisps around you your body, almost as if something happens I didn't read fast enough. <laughs> All right, guys, so it's my turn, and I'm fighting this particular creature, this Aberus. Uh, down here, we've got ourselves our runes. We can take these runes, and we can drag them in place. It kind of tells us right here. Mix two runes to create a spell. So let's say uh, I take a look at the character, and I see up here, well, this character is weak to fire. It has a resistance to water and earth. So I probably want to, in fighting this particular creature, I probably want to uh, use as much fire as I can in my, in my spell creation. Um, it tells me up here it's an attacker. That's going to mean something. It's going to mean something depending on the creatures you fight. Later on, we go over here and we check out our spell books and we take a look at the enemies now. Uh, we now have this guy here and it tells us what exactly what that means. He's an attacker. He has a weakness to fire. A little bit about the creature. Okay, so there's a lot of lore they put into the game as well. So in order to make a spell, I'm going to grab a rune, drag it in, and drop it in place. Uh, and I'm going to use the red and the green because it said that the red and green, that the, it's, it's, it's resistant to both water and earth. So I'm not going to use water and earth. When I mix a rune, it comes in here and it creates a spell for me. In this particular case, it's, it's using fire and wind as my two runes. Uh, casting blaze deals damage and has a 100% chance to inflict, to inflict the burn status. So if I click this, it automatically hurts that creature. It does 100 damage to it. And that's now the enemy's turn. They, in turn, will attack me. Okay. We can see up here that that burn effect is in place, and they're going to continue to burn. Now, I do have a cooldown. I can't use that same spell again, but I can reverse how those runes are working. So I could grab the wind and put it in first, then I can grab the fire and put it in second, and it's going to create a, another, uh, another spell. 
Wind and Fire this time. Casting Smog deals an area of effect damage and inflicts the poison status effect on your main target, but has an 80% chance to be applied to other enemies. If there's, if there's only one enemy on the battlefield, it will always be an 80% chance. In this particular case, using the spell will only give me an 80% chance of inflicting the uh, the area of effect damage, or sorry, the the um, poison damage as well. All right, they're still on fire, so they're taking damage. Let me cast my spell. All right, I got lucky there. He's now poisoned for two turns, and now he's hitting me. All right, all of my statuses took place. He's almost dead. I'm on cooldown with both of these, so I'm going to have to use a fire spell, and I'll pick a different one to, uh, you know, maybe I'll pick a fire and a water. Uh, they are immune or resistant to water damage, uh, but I am including the fire in there, so maybe it's going to be good. Casting steam will remove all the debuffs and heal 15% of maximum HP. Okay, so this is a heal for me. Uh, it's going to allow me to heal 15% of my HP. Um... But it's going to get rid of my debuffs as well. I don't have any debuffs, and I don't think it's worth it. So at this point in time, I'm not going to... Uh... Oh, it says here, if you have no debuffs, uh, the healing will be increased to 20% max. I don't really need that yet. I'm not low enough, so I'm not going to use a spell. So instead, I'll drag this away, and let's drop the, the earth in there. This one is going to be Fire Earth. Casting Erupt will do AoE of damage, and will and if your hit points is 50% or less, the damage will be doubled. Well, I'm not 50%, but still, that's probably going to be enough to actually kill off this creature, so I'm going to push my, uh, my Earthquake damage. Ah, I didn't kill him. He's going to hit me now. Okay, good. So my air, my, uh, my different, um... My different buffs, debuffs, or sorry, my different buffs uh, actually harmed it. They had the different effects, uh, and now I've moved on to the second wave. All right, guys, I'm going to go dark. I'm going to play until the end of this first tower, and after that, uh, I'm going to uh, move on to the next game. So the last game of my third years that I'm showing off today um, was a solo developer. This is a, a visual novel style game, kind of a, not just a visual novel, it's a visual novel, yes, but it's also a, a hidden object style game. Um, so if I hit play here, we're going to go into and we're going to kind of get the information about what this game actually is about. Um, you play a detective and the detective is... Uh, uh, the detective is looking for someone who's been missing. In fact, this gentleman right here is missing. He's a, a professor who is studying um, lizards or something. I forget exactly what he's studying. Uh, these two have an argument. The, his, the husband and wife have an argument. He leaves, and he's never heard from again. So this person runs out, she finds the wife runs out, she finds you, the detective, who's supposed to go in and in turn find out what happened to George. All right, there's a little bit of a setup here. New York City, the time, September the 21st. It's our detective agency. And now we've moved into the detective agency uh, where we are introduced to the, the whole point of this. So Celine is quite upset. She's panting, what's wrong? Um, yeah, she's quite upset. She needs some help. She can't find her husband, George. We kind of already had this thing initially set up. Um, so in turn, what she mentions to you is the fact that he's missing. She falls down here. Um, and... In turn, we end up taking the case. So you find out that um, 
George it was in the past the detective's best friend. Uh, that's why she comes to you as a detective. You were once his best friend. Uh, and she's hoping that because of your knowledge about uh, about George, that maybe you'll be able to help uh, help find him uh, a little easier. He's not a professor, actually. He works at a high school. That's what it was. Yeah, he works at a high school. Um, so we're supposed to go to the high school now, and we're supposed to, in turn, look for clues in the high school. All right, so let me get through to the first section here. And once we're there, uh, I'll play the, just the first level. Related to lizards, so she gives you just a little bit of background about the actual, the actual character. Spelling mistake in there, Jolene. Like I said, this is a single developer, a solo developer, um, who actively. The way that our program works is every student kind of picks what they're interested in. You self-specialize. Obviously, it's really difficult to become an expert in all aspects of game. It's such a massive industry, right? So students in turn decide to uh, decide what they want to kind of specialize in. Uh, in this particular case, what so in the, all the other cases, in the games you've seen up until now, each of the students kind of went into their role. If they were a programmer, they did the programming. If they were artists, they did the art, and so on. Uh, in this particular case, as I mentioned, uh, this student decided that they wanted to do solo dev work. They wanted to do everything from start, and fit, start to finish. They had, uh, this person had decided, this student had decided that, you know, they wanted to really have that experience where they kind of did everything themselves. So they took a scaled back game. Obviously, this doesn't have the same scope as the other games that you've seen. However, as a solo dev project, it was well within the scope of what a solo dev could do, particularly because, as I've mentioned, this is not about, um, it's, it's, it's about students, my program is about students choosing a specialty, self-specializing. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the student has done all of it. Okay, so we start off in an alley. This is a terrible alley to hide behind a, a high school. <laughs> But this alley is in the back, and basically this is how the game itself works. I'm going to go through, and I'm going to click on different uh, different objects. It's going to tell me a little bit about the objects. All right, so we're looking for a shovel, a key, and some glass shards. Well, there's a shovel right here. If you click on it, it tells you, okay, there's something on about the shovel. Wait a minute. There's a blood stain on the shovel. All right. I'm gonna take a photo, it could mean something. So in turn, the detective is going to look for certain things. When you find these certain things, it's going to give you information about those objects. And it's your job as a detective, obviously, to piece together the clues to find out what happened to George. At the end, you're gonna to have to tell Celine what happened. A torn up shirt. Whose could it have been? And why is it still lying here? Uh, a pill bottle. Some pills back here. Schizophrenia pills. They're just lying around in the back of the alley behind this high school. All right, so we found those. We're looking for a wine bottle right here. Someone's been drinking out here. Bottle of wine. And again, obviously some of these clues have more to them than the others. Uh, a key. Uh, a key right here. So come in handy, that's gonna let us get into the actual place. And glass shards, so I'll click on the glass shards. All right, that's everything in the alley. I can now move on. All right guys, so that's kind of the tutorial. Uh, they take you to the tutorial here, and then afterwards we're gonna go through several different levels to kind of figure out what's happening. So I'm gonna go dark for a minute here, I'm gonna play one more of these, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna call it a day. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed that. That is the end of our third year uh, expose here where I'm introducing the third years. These are the games that I was allowed to demonstrate and I hope you guys enjoyed it. My third years all worked really hard on these games. Like I said, it's a one semester project. It is one course in that full semester that they, that they handle. It's 
not the only thing they do. So the fact they've got this much work done is fantastic. My students all worked really, really hard. My faculty who acted as mentors worked really, really hard. And I think overall, they have had some great results. A lot of the students are, the students are all pleased with what they've done here. Uh, the student teams are varying in sizes. Each of the students kind of got the opportunity to work in the area that they wanted to. So this was the third year capstone. This occurs in the first semester of third year. We do a capstone in the Centennial Game uh, game program, game development program. Um, we do a capstone every year. So in your first year, in your second semester of first year, you do a yearly capstone. You work on games uh, and then you, again, you produce a single game over the entirety of the semester. The same thing happens in the second year. In your second semester of second year, you do a capstone that encompasses everything you've learned up until that point and then finally in your third year you have the opportunity to work on kind of any game you want all right guys i hope you enjoyed it if you did let me know down below with a thumbs up if not i don't care <laughs> i'm not really doing this anymore a whole lot this is for my students like i said i'm super super proud of the work they've done and i hope you guys enjoyed it all right everyone thumbs up thumbs down comments down below and if you haven't done so please take a few seconds to subscribe have yourselves a wonderful day, everyone.